Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Bundespräsident, sehr geehrter Herr Elke Büdenbender, sehr geehrte Mitglieder des Bundestages, des Abgeordnetenhauses, Exzellenzen und zum ersten Mal von mir ausgesprochen Magnifizenzen, sehr geehrte Frau Präsidentin, sehr geehrter Herr Ardascho, es ist mir eine Ehre und eine große Freude, meine Damen und Herren, Sie alle im Humboldt-Jahr als Intendantin dieses Hauses begrüßen zu dürfen. Ich muss Ihnen allen nicht sagen, dass dies ein geschichtsträchtiger Ort ist. Wie kein anderes Gebäude in Berlin steht die Singakademie, die heute das Gorki-Theater beherbergt, für die romantische Fortführung der Aufklärung im Geiste des Zusammendenkens und der Demokratisierung von Kunst, Wissenschaft und Politik. Es ist daher, wie schon zuvor bei den Berliner Korrespondenzen an unserem Haus, mehr als eine symbolische Geste, dass nun auch die Auftaktveranstaltung der Kosmoslesungen in genau dieser Tradition hier stattfindet. Es ist eine wunderbare Idee der Humboldt-Universität, Alexander von Humboldt mit wissenschaftlicher Praxis zu gedenken. Wie jede Geschichte aber, ist auch die Geschichte dieses Ortes widersprüchlich und komplex. Es ist die Geschichte der großen Weltentwürfe in der Gleichzeitigkeit mit der Hochkonjunktur des Sklavenhandels. Es ist die Geschichte der Überführung der Kompositionen Bachs in den säkularen Kanon in der Gleichzeitigkeit mit dem Antisemitismus der mendelssohn Bartholdi an diesem Ort entgegenstand. Es ist die Geschichte von großen denkenden Männern in der Gleichzeitigkeit mit der Unterdrückung weiblichen Denkens und Forschens. Es ist die Geschichte der Befreiung durch die Soldatinnen der Roten Armee und der Wiedererrichtung als Theater stalinistischer Prägung. Wissenschaft, politisches Denken und Kunst stehen in der Verantwortung der Vereinfachung zu widerstehen. Denkmale aus Stein können das nicht leisten, sondern nur die Diskussion, die der Wissenschaft als Bühne der Faktizität bedarf, die die Kunst benötigt als Labor sozialer Fantasie, und die auf eine Politik hofft, die fähig ist, Kunst und Wissenschaft zuzuhören. Damit begrüße ich Sie, die Vertreter von Kunst, Wissenschaft und Politik, aufs Herzlichste zur Auftaktveranstaltung der Kosmoslesungen, die in ihrer international hochkarätigen Besetzung zeigt, dass die Wissenschaft den Weg aus der selbstverschuldeten Unmündigkeit ihrer eurozentristischen Fixierung gefunden zu haben scheint, während wir hier und heute die Idee dieses wissenschaftlichen Fortschritts im Geiste Humboldts feiern, scheint sich leider das Rad der Vernunft in der politischen Wirklichkeit weltweit zurückzudrehen. Davon zeugt vielleicht auch die Haltung des heutigen Gastes. Ich wünsche mir deshalb, dass uns Impulse wie diese Veranstaltung dazu dienen, uns dieser Entwicklung gemeinsam entgegenzustellen. In diesem Sinne herzlich willkommen im Gorki und ich darf nun diesen Platz mit Dank an dem 1827 Humboldt seine Kosmosvorlesung begann, an die Präsidentin der Humboldt-Universität zu Berlin, Frau Professor Kunst, weitergeben. Vielen, vielen Dank. Schön, dass Sie da sind. Sehr geehrter Herr Bundespräsident Steinmeier, sehr geehrte Frau Büdenwender, sehr geehrte Mitglieder des Bundestages und des Abgeordnetenhauses von Berlin, Herr Staatssekretär, sehr geehrte Exzellenzen, sehr geehrte Magnifizenzen, Präsidenten, sehr geehrte Frau Intendantin, sehr geehrter Herr Attagio, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich lade Sie zu einer kleinen Reise in die Vergangenheit ein. Wir schreiben Donnerstag, den 6. Dezember 1827, es ist 11.40 Uhr, 
Alexander von Humboldt tritt kräftig in die Pedale, denn er ist spät dran. In 20 Minuten soll er zum ersten Mal einen öffentlichen Vortrag hier in der Singakademie halten. Die Vorlesungssäle der benachbarten Universität sind einfach zu klein geworden und platzen regelmäßig aus allen Nähten. Alexander spricht über Astronomie, Geografie, Geologie, Botanik und Zoologie gern mit großem Engagement und nicht nur vor den gelehrten Kollegen. Bis zu 1000 Zuhörer kommen, werden sich in den kommenden Wochen und Monaten zu Humboldts öffentlichen Vorlesungen über die physikalische Geografie finden. Darunter Handwerker und Professoren, Studenten und Ministerialbeamte. Der Besuch einer Humboldt-Vorlesung wird zum gesellschaftlichen Ereignis. Alexander von Humboldt begründet mit diesen später Kosmos-Vorlesungen genannten Veranstaltungen die populäre Wissensvermittlung. Vielleicht können wir uns nach dem Vortrag von Herrn Attagio darüber austauschen, was Sie von meiner kurzen Beschreibung besonders behalten haben. Die Größe des Publikums. Mit 1000 Zuschauern war der Saal damals überfüllt. Offiziell gab es nur Platz für 800. Es waren aber immer mehr da. Heute reichen die Stühle für 440 Gäste. Und wir freuen uns über jeden, der heute den Weg zu uns gefunden hat. Oder haben Sie sich den Namen des Gebäudes gemerkt? 1827 war hier im Maxim Gorki die Berliner Singakademie zu Hause. Mit Sicherheit ist den meisten aber aufgefallen, dass Alexander ganz sicher nicht strampelnd mit einer Pedale auf dem Rad unterwegs war, nämlich das erste Fahrrad mit Pedalen wurde erst 1860 gebaut, also mehr als 30 Jahre später. Worauf ich hinaus will, jede Zuhörerin, jeder Zuhörer, nimmt aus einer Vorlesung bedingt durch Vorbildung, Interessen oder auch Tagesformen sehr unterschiedliche Erkenntnisse mit. Das ist vollkommen in Ordnung und war unter den Zuhörern Humboldts nicht anders. Es gibt, unterschiedliche, es gibt etliche unterschiedliche zeitgenössische Mitschriften und sie unterscheiden sich kolossal, nicht in Bezug auf die mitgeteilten Fakten, aber darin, was der Einzelne einer Notiz für würdig befunden hat und was dadurch überliefert wurde. Was Alexander von Humboldt auszeichnete, war seine Neugier, seine Offenheit, seine Bereitschaft, sich einzulassen und der Wunsch, möglichst viele Menschen an seinen Erfahrungen und an seinem Wissen teilhaben zu lassen. So schreibt Caroline von Humboldt, die Umrisse eines kolossalen Gegenstandes weiß er mit wahrhaft großartiger Einfachheit zu umschreiben und gerade dadurch ein Bild dem inneren Sinn zu geben. Als Humboldt-Universität zu Berlin halten wir es hier gern und engagiert mit unserem Namenspatron. Auch wir möchten, dass sich viele Menschen mit den Themen befassen, die uns als Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler umtreiben dass sie sich auseinandersetzen und anschließend miteinander, aber auch mit uns ins Gespräch kommen. Unterschiedliche Zugänge zu einem Thema bereichern den Diskurs und eröffnen neue Perspektiven. Das gilt auch für Widersprüche und Kritik. Das 21. Jahrhundert hat, wie nicht anders zu erwarten, meine Damen und Herren, einen eigenen Begriff für den Austausch von Erfahrungen und Wissen geprägt. Knowledge Exchange. Wir als Forschende möchten viel stärker als bisher in den Austausch mit Menschen kommen, die nicht aus unserem unmittelbaren Arbeitsumfeld kommen. Zum Beispiel im Kontext unseres Exzellenzclusters Matters of Activity. Die hier engagierten Forscherinnen und Forscher streben danach, Bilder, Räume und Materialien als Bauformen zu entwickeln, in denen sich Natur und Kultur in neuartiger Weise verschränken. Und es liegt eigentlich auf der Hand, dass der Austausch mit ganz verschiedenen Gewerken den Forschenden dabei enorm weiterhelfen kann. Ein Metallbildner, ein 3D-Designer oder eine Ingenieurin können jahrelange Erfahrung aus der Praxis in den wissenschaftlichen Prozess einbringen. Wenn aktuell und verstärkt an die Wissenschaft die Forderung herangetragen wird, sich mehr zu öffnen, und der Gesellschaft zu erklären, was sie da tut, dann greift diese Forderung im Grunde zu kurz. 
Es reicht nicht, wenn wir unsere Forschung nur erklären. Für uns sind die Erfahrungen, Assoziationen, Bilder und Weltsichten der verschiedenen Menschen eine notwendige Bereicherung unserer eigenen Arbeit. Um sie zu erfahren, ist der Dialog, sind Formate des Austauschs so wichtig. Ganz aktuell wollen wir das mit unserer Ausstellungsfläche im Humboldt-Forum, aber auch beispielsweise im Tieranatomischen Theater erproben. Zwei Orte von vielen, an denen wir den Austausch von Knowledge mit Besuchern aus Deutschland und der Welt organisieren werden. Jetzt freue ich mich aber erst einmal auf den Wissensaustausch mit Ihnen. Insgesamt zehn Kosmoslesungen werden wir aus Anlass des 250. Geburtstages Humboldt anbieten. Und Sie sind uns herzlich willkommen zu jeder Einzelnen. Meine Damen und Herren, es ist mir eine große Freude und noch größere Ehre, das Wort an den Bundespräsidenten weiterzugeben. Meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, die meisten kennen das. Man zieht in eine neue Stadt und noch bevor die Kisten ausgepackt sind, geht man auf Entdeckungstour. Wo ist der nächste Italiener? Andere vielleicht eher, wo ist die nächste günstige Laufstrecke? Und liebe Jermin, natürlich zuallererst die Frage, wo ist das nächste vernünftige Theater? So war das auch, als wir vor, meine Frau und ich, vor etwa 20 Jahren nach Berlin gezogen sind. U-Bahn, S-Bahn, ABC, laute Wochenmärkte, stille Seen. Das alles war schnell erkundet. Selbstverständlich, Frau Präsidentin, liebe Sabine Kunst, auch die Humboldt-Universität hatten wir dann bald für uns entdeckt und dabei schnell erfahren, wie man die beiden Statuen vor dem Hauptgebäude unterscheidet. Wilhelm links Richtung Wilhelmstraße und rechts Richtung Alexanderplatz, Alexander von Humboldt. Ich dachte, das sei Bekannte, ne? Die Eselsbrücke eigentlich jedenfalls ist bekannt, gerade hier an der Humboldt-Universität. Und ganz sicher ist bei den Deutschen der bekannt, der nach links schaut, Wilhelm von Humboldt. Seinen Geburtstag haben wir im vorletzten Jahr gefeiert und auch diejenigen, die nie ein Wort im Original von ihm gelesen haben, die wissen, das ist der, dessen Name für Bildungsreform und deutsche Universitätsideale steht. Der Bruder Alexander hat es da jedenfalls im Vergleich ungleich schwerer. Gerade der, der die Welt nach Deutschland getragen hat, der uns beigebracht hat, dass uns diese Welt etwas angeht. Ein Mensch, den das Erkunden einer Stadt vielleicht ebenfalls gereizt hat, aber dem das ganz sicher nie gereicht hätte. Er war der Deutsche, den es über Meere und Berge zog, von Chimborazzo in den Anden bis zum Altaigebirge in Sibirien. Vor fast 250 Jahren im September wurde er geboren als preußischer Adliger von der Mutter im Tegeler Schloss. Die beiden Söhne sprachen regelmäßig vom Schloss Langweil. Von der Mutter aufs Gleis gesetzt in den Staatsdienst, als Kind dann stets im Wetteifer mit dem älteren Bruder und dann doch so ganz anders, gegen jede Erwartung und Konvention eine wirkliche Ausnahmeerscheinung. Für mich war Alexander von Humboldt immer einer meiner Helden. Der andere Preuße, der Entdecker, der Aufklärer oder der Erfinder der Natur, wie Andrea Wolf schreibt. Leicht hatte er es dabei nie mit den deutschen Landsleuten. Nach seinem Tod, kaum zwölf Jahre später, hatte man ihn, den internationalen Superstar, schon weitgehend aus der nationalen Erinnerung verdrängt. Als zu kosmopolitisch, 
Zu franzosenfreundlich für das Deutsche Reich galt er vielen, als zu eklektisch, romantisch und populär manchen seine Wissenschaft. Und umso mehr, das sage ich aufrichtig, freue ich mich, dass wir Alexander von Humboldt zum 250. Geburtstag als den feiern können, der er tatsächlich war. Als einen großen deutschen Kosmopoliten, der Mensch und Natur mit Hingabe und Neugier beobachtete, der unermüdlich ungeahnte Zusammenhänge aufzeigte, der seine Begeisterung auf Millionen seiner zu Hörer und Leser auf der ganzen Welt zu übertragen verstand und der, da bin ich sicher, die Welt, mindestens die Weltsicht, mit seinem Tun verändert hat. Schon vor zwei Jahrhunderten hat Alexander von Humboldt erkannt, wie sehr alles mit allem zusammenhängt. Alles ist Wechselwirkung, schrieb er und hat damit ein schier grenzenloses Verständnis von Vernetzung, Globalisierung und Interaktion geprägt. Sein vernetztes Denken durchbrach Disziplinen und Stände, überspannte Völker und Kontinente und trennte nicht mehr zwischen Natur und Kultur. Im schwierigen Geschäft des Weltverstehens hat Humboldt wirklich einen Standard gesetzt, vermutlich einen Standard der uns bis heute herausfordert. Weltverstehen war für Humboldt vor allem das Geschäft, auch selbstkritische Geschäft der eigenen Anschauung. Er wurde fast 90 Jahre alt, hatte als junger Mann Simon Bolivar zum Freund und feierte seinen 60. Geburtstag mit Lenins Großvater in Russland. Seine abenteuerlichen Expeditionen sind bis heute berühmt für sein Wirken ebenso wichtig, ebenso wichtig wie die Expeditionen war aber die Zeit nach den Reisen, die Zeit am Schreibtisch und im Hörsaal. Dort entstanden seine Bestseller und seine Vorlesungen. Dort wuchs das weltweite Netzwerk der Geistesgrößen seiner Zeit mit, Sie ahnen es, Humboldt im Zentrum. Er richtet über wirklich Zehntausende von Briefwechsel, die überwiegend erhalten geblieben sind und dort an diesem Schreibtisch in der Kommunikation mit der Welt, dort lag die Hauptstadt der ersten globalen Gelehrtenrepublik. An so vielen Orten hat er gewirkt, über derart viele Themen geforscht, ein so intensives Leben geführt, dass man eigentlich schlicht nicht von dem Alexander von Humboldt sprechen kann. Im Gegenteil, erst wenn wir anerkennen, wie vielschichtig und facettenreich er war, kommen wir ihm wahrscheinlich überhaupt näher. Auf einer meiner jüngsten Lateinamerika-Reise, Begleiter sind hier im Saal, stöhnte einer meiner wissenschaftlichen Begleiter so richtig, von Humboldt kann man eigentlich überhaupt nur im Plural reden. Das erscheint mir durchaus ein plausibler Gedanke zu sein, gerade weil er Spannungen zulässt und Uneindeutigkeiten aushält. Humboldt war Humanist, Verehrer der französischen Revolution und Demokrat, doch wenn man genauer hinschaut, stets von Krone, Adel und Obrigkeitsstaat abhängig. Er dachte vernetzt und kannte keine disziplinären Grenzen, sammelte und beschrieb alles, was er in die Hände bekam, prägte aber am Ende keine spezifische Fachrichtung so nachhaltig, wie das manchen seiner großen Koryphäen, die nach ihm kamen, gelungen ist. Er war großzügig mit Geld und Gedanken, förderte den Nachwuchs, unterhielt die Gesellschaft, schwang zugleich aber auch eine ausnehmend spitze Feder, zuweilen auch gegen die selbsternannten Spitzen der Gesellschaft. In den Pariser Salons war seine scharfe Zunge, meine Damen und Herren, angeblich so gefürchtet, dass man es tunlichst vermied, vor ihm den Raum zu verlassen. Verehrte Gäste, wenn ich aber eine der vielen Facetten von Humboldt nennen müsste, die mich besonders beeindruckt haben, 
dann wäre es die schier grenzenlose Fähigkeit zur Begeisterung, zur Neugier, zum Staunen, zum Atemlosen, Bewundern, zum Sammeln und Katalogisieren, ja, aber eben auch zum packenden Erzählen von der Natur und den Menschen. Humboldts Werk, das wird der ein oder andere bei der Lektüre festgestellt haben, ist eminent lesbar. Sie ist emotional, sie ist zugänglich. Expertensprache und Statistik, das lebt meistens in den Fußnoten. Seine Bücher sind auch für ungeübte Leser verständlich und sie erhalten durch kunstvolle Schaubilder, ein bisschen was sehen wir davon hier, eine ganz eigene, geradezu atemberaubende visuelle Ästhetik. Alexander von Humboldt wollte gelesen und er wollte vor allen Dingen verstanden werden. Nirgendwo war diese Eigenschaft deutlicher sichtbar als bei den Kosmos-Vorträgen hier in der Berliner Singakademie. Nach seiner Vorlesung für die Gelehrten, Sie haben es eben gehört, drüben in der Universität kam er hierher und trug erneut noch einmal vor für alle und auch das verständlich und begeisternd, wenn Sie so wollen, ein Aufklärer im wirklich wahrsten Sinne des Wortes. Deshalb bin ich heute besonders gern hier. Was heute manchmal etwas trocken Wissenschaftsvermittlung heißt, das war für Humboldt eines seiner wichtigsten Anliegen oder vielleicht sollte man sogar sagen sein Handwerk. Mit diesem Anliegen ist Humboldt unverändert aktuell, denn in diesem sperrigen Begriff der Wissenschaftsvermittlung steckt ja nicht nur der Gedanke, möglichst viele Menschen auch jenseits von Bibliotheken und Forschungslaboren, möglichst viele Menschen an der Faszination und Freude der Wissenschaft teilhaben zu lassen. Wenn das gelingt, ist schon viel gelungen, aber es geht noch um mehr. Sondern darin steckt eben auch ein Anspruch, und zwar der Anspruch, dass eine freie, lebendige, und ich füge hinzu, auch eine finanziell gut ausgestattete Wissenschafts- und Forschungslandschaft für diese Gesellschaft von zentraler Bedeutung ist. Und auch deshalb bin ich froh über diese neue Reihe der Kosmoslesungen hier im Humboldt-Jahr. Sie, verehrte Frau Präsidentin, die Humboldt-Universität, erinnern damit nicht nur an den großen Jubilar, das auch und das hat er verdient, sondern sie setzen ein starkes Zeichen für den Austausch von Wissenschaft und Gesellschaft. Ich glaube, diesen Geist der Kosmosvorlesung den brauchen wir heute mindestens so sehr, bin versucht zu sagen, noch viel mehr als zu Humboldts Zeiten. Wir leben in Zeiten des Umbruchs. Wir erleben immer schnellere, machtvollere Wellen technologischer Disruption. Wir erleben einen scharfen globalen Wettbewerb, der längst nicht mehr nur ein ökonomischer, sondern ein politischer, ein sogar systemischer Wettbewerb geworden ist. Gerade in solchen Zeiten dürfen wir bei allen tagesaktuellen, hitzigen politischen Debatten von der Migrationsfrage bis zu Sicherheitsthemen, bei all dem dürfen wir eines nicht vergessen. Die Zukunft der Welt, auch die Zukunft unseres Wohlstandes, hängt mehr denn je davon ab, ob wir weltweit auf Augenhöhe und im Austausch an wissenschaftlicher Erkenntnis und belastbaren Lösungen arbeiten. Wenn wir in Deutschland weiterhin Gestalter der Zukunft sein wollen und nicht Getriebene, dann verdienen Wissenschaft und Forschung höchste gesellschaftliche Priorität. Meine Damen und Herren, bevor ich gleich zum Schluss komme und die Bühne frei mache für den Eröffnungsvortrag des heutigen Tages für den wohl berühmtesten brasilianischen Klimaforscher Professor Paolo Attaggio, erlauben Sie mir noch einen letzten Gedanken. Humboldts Drang, seine Begeisterung für die Natur an uns weiterzugeben, das war für ihn nie Selbstzweck. In klaren Worten hat er schon damals vor einem ausschließlich anthropozentrischen Blick auf die Welt gewarnt. Die eitle Selbstliebe viele seiner Zeitgenossen das rücksichtslose Streben nach persönlichem Reichtum und der Missachtung der Würde anderer, 
die Unmenschlichkeit der Sklaverei, alles das hat er zu seiner Zeit schon heftig kritisiert. Sein Plädoyer war, den Menschen als Teil der Natur zu verstehen und die Natur als Verkörperung des großen Ganzen. Ich bin sicher, er, Humboldt, er hätte nicht das geringste Verständnis gehabt, wenn heute vereinbarte Klimaziele gekündigt, in Frage gestellt und wissenschaftliche Erkenntnis verspottet wird. Die Vermüllung der Ozeane, Artensterben, extreme Wetterlagen, Abschmelzen der Gletscher, Dürren, Wassermangel, dadurch ausgelöste politische Konflikte und massenhafte Wanderungsbewegungen, all das hat er nicht im Detail voraussehen können oder vorausgesagt. Aber das und wie sehr Eingriffe des Menschen die Natur verändern und ihr schaden können, wie in der Folge auch den Menschen schaden können, all das sah er und er hat es den Zeitgenossen zu vermitteln versucht. Schon vor 200 Jahren hat Alexander von Humboldt uns gelehrt, dass der Mensch eine Bedeutung in der Natur hat und eben daraus Verantwortung für die Natur trägt. Auch dass Veränderungen von Natur und Umwelt nicht an Landesgrenzen Halt machen, auch das können wir bei ihm lernen. Zwei Jahrhunderte nach Humboldt, meine Damen und Herren, sollten wir eigentlich weiter sein. Weiter nicht nur in der Erkenntnis, weiter vor allen Dingen in unserem täglichen Handeln. Meine Damen und Herren, natürlich ist das eine Erwartung, weiter zu sein im täglichen Handeln. Natürlich ist das eine Erwartung, die zuerst an Regierungen, Parlamente und Unternehmenszentralen geht, nämlich unsere Wirtschaften, unseren Energieverbrauch, unsere Ressourcennutzung an den längst bekannten Notwendigkeiten auszurichten. Aber ich bin sicher, auch den Einzelnen hätte Humboldt nicht aus der Verantwortung entlassen. Im Gegenteil, als Verbraucher, die wir jeden Tag Entscheidungen treffen, ob im Supermarkt, beim Fahrzeugkauf oder bei der Urlaubsplanung, ich bin mir sicher, er würde uns heute, 200 Jahre später, kräftig in die Pflicht nehmen. Und schließlich, da bin ich mir sicher, Hoffnungen hätte Humboldt vor allen Dingen auf die menschliche Vernunft und die Wissenschaft gesetzt. Also in die Fähigkeit zur Entwicklung innovativer Methoden und Technologien, die Bereitschaft zu fortschreitendem Erkenntnisgewinn über Wechselwirkungen und Zusammenhänge und das alles gepaart mit der Bereitschaft von Menschen aus wissenschaftlicher Erkenntnis die richtigen Schlüsse zum Erhalt der Welt für die kommenden Generationen zu ziehen. Genau deshalb, meine Damen und Herren, gehören Wissenschaft und Gesellschaft untrennbar zusammen. Ich glaube, Alexander von Humboldt hätte heute ebenso wenig Verständnis für Politiker, die wissenschaftliche Fakten bestreiten, wie für Wissenschaftler, die mit Politik nichts am Hut haben wollen. Lassen Sie uns also das Jubiläumsjahr dieser Ausnahmeerscheinung zum Anlass nehmen, uns an seine Neugier, seine Begeisterung, sein politisches Denken, seine Liebe zu Mensch und Natur zu erinnern und möglichst viel davon in unsere Zeit zu übersetzen. Das wünsche ich uns. Und das wünsche ich der Neuausgabe der Kosmosvorlesung. Herzlichen Dank. Sehr geehrter Herr Bundespräsident Steinmeier, sehr geehrte Mitglieder des Deutschen Bundestags und des Berliner Abgeordnetenhauses, sehr geehrte Exzellenzen, sehr geehrter Herr Staatssekretär, sehr geehrte Frau Intendantin, sehr geehrte Magnifizienzen und Spektabilitäten, liebe Frau Kunst. During the last months I have had the pleasure as the Director of the Geography Department of Humboldt University to Berlin 
to help organizing the 2019 Cosmos Lecture Series on the occasion of the 250th birthday of Alexander von Humboldt. It was our idea to ask speakers to commemorate the ideas and talks of Alexander von Humboldt, bring them into context with today's research, and please have an outlook what, what is on stage in the 21st century. These 10 lectures in 2019, starting today with this opening lecture, will go through all of the year until November 2019, when we will have a final speaker from New Zealand invited by the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung. In late August, we will have a sustainability conference to commemorate Alexander von Humboldt with a public debate. I think there's a lot of things to celebrate this year, and I'm really proud that we can have this opening today with a really distinguished speaker. So, please let me introduce Professor Dr. Paolo Artascio to you, who is the speaker of today's Cosmos Lecture. Um, Dr. Artascio, based at the Universidad de Sao Paulo in Brazil, is a distinguished scholar with a background in environmental physics. He has been lead author and contributing also on several of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel of Climatic Change reports. Among those reports, there was the one that led the United Nations IPCC to receive the Peace Nobel Prize. So, dear Paolo, we look forward to today's Cosmos Lecture, opening this a long time after Alexander von Humboldt has been within the same hall, within the same famous room, and it is a pleasure to have you here. The stage is yours, Paolo. I look forward to your talk. I have it to turn on the microphone. Okay, first, I would like to thank you very much the federal president, the president of Humboldt University for this opportunity to be here to talk with you uh, with the two, uh, I think, very critically important scientific issues we are facing today. One of them is the scientific challenges of global climate change, and the other one is, of course, what will happen with Amazonian forest that is a critical piece of the Earth system uh, that keeps the climate as we know right now. So basically, uh, first, when I was reading Humboldt's uh, work in the, in the last few weeks, uh, several things uh, come up uh, to my mind. Okay, the first one, that his view of, uh, of the cosmos has a really nice unifying perspective of the studies of natural science and mankind. So basically at that time, this was very much integrated and it's very hard to do that in the university as we have the university today. But the most important thing is actually that Humboldt suggests that you have to contemplate the beauty of the cosmos to obtain a personal inspiration and a beneficial awareness about life. So this makes the science very different from the science we do on a day-by-day -day basis, I think, you know? So I will try to follow this kind of uh, philosophy. So the story I will start to tell you, it's a very long story, actually 4.5 billion years ago, when actually our planet uh, started to be formed. Well, after a very, very long evolution, you know, the evolution of life and geology in our planet always came together exactly as Humboldt uh, has worked with it, you know. But just for you to have an important point is that we as a species just showed up in this history only 200,000 years ago. So it's a very, very, very short time in 4.6 billion years. So humans uh, are present in the history of our planet 
uh, just on the very last second. And that's an important thing to have in mind, you know, because you need to take care of the planet and the other species we share in this planet as best as we can. And you will see that probably we are not doing that very well. So basically, uh, if you look that we are changing the face of our planet very quickly and in many, many different ways. If you look into several of the socio-economic trends, you see in terms of human population, using of natural resources, use of water, aquifers, and so on, you will see that everything goes exponentially. So, you don't need to be a statistician to see that this uh, cannot go like that in a planet with limited natural resources. And these pressures are making a lot of different uh, impacts on the planet ecosystem. That goes for the, for instance, surface temperature, ocean acidification, coastal nitrogen, aquaculture, everything is going up also. In a planet with the limited natural resources, again, uh, this cannot continue. And the question is, which will be the impact in our society of all this change? This is probably one of the most important questions we have in science today. And it's, we have to answer this question to our society as scientific community, and also to provide the policymaker the best alternative on how to deal with these pressure, pressuring issues. This uh, was recognized in the scientific community as cover of many of the nature and science issues. I choose this one that basically define that you are entering in the Anthropocene. And they define the Anthropocene as a time when humans and our civilization become a major geophysical planetary force. This is really a very strong statement. So basically we are taking over one single species in 4.6 billion years, we are taking uh, care of the whole planet. This was uh, recognized by scientists, but also in terms of economy. This is the cover from The Economist in 2011, Welcome to the Anthropocene. So basically, not just from the scientific point of view, but also, and most important, for the societal point of view, we are taking over the planet. And there are many ways that you can see this. This is a, a, a plot from the last uh, intergovernmental panel on the biodiversity that was released a few months ago. So basically, this is uh, how much of the land are you taking over in terms of agriculture, in terms of uh, water resources, and so on. So you're going to see that the human appropriation is very high in Europe, in India, in China, United States, all over the place. So basically, we are taking over 60% of the planet surface, one single species, us. And then if you look for the amount of wilderness area, there are very few uh, wilderness area in the boreal forest, in the Amazon forest, in the deserts of Sahara and Australia. So basically, only 23% of the total land area is remaining, let's say, as we find out 200,000 years ago. So this has a lot of different impacts, like, like changing soil organic carbon that's critical for agriculture and many other uh, aspects. A group of scientists a few years ago uh, sit together to, to try to discuss what are the limits that we can go on without really going over critical limits in our planet. That's not an easy task for, this, for science. And basically, they identified 90 different boundaries that includes biodiversity, land system change, biogeochemical flows, ocean acidification, and so on. And basically, from the 90 boundaries, four of them we have already passed uh, the dangerous limit. It's basically on climate, biodiversity, land use in terms of deforestation, on biogeochemical cycles. We are injecting 
three times more nitrogen than the natural system injects into the, the, into the forest and, and land, and land a, as a whole. So basically, uh, if you see this, we have a problem. And what is the reason for this problem? Many of them. One of them is our uh, use of uh, fossil fuels. So this is from the Industrial Revolution until 2015. CO2 emissions in gigatons of CO2 per year. You will see that you are emitting about 40 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere per year. And 75 of these 40 gigatons, or 80%, came from actually uh, fossil fuel and only 10% from land use change right now. But of course, land use change dominated the emissions until the 40s and 50s, and then fossil fuel started to dominate it completely. So these emissions, if the reservoir is very, very small because the atmosphere, 80% of the mass of the atmosphere is on the first 15 kilometers. So it's just a very, very, very thin reservoir. So if you inject this huge amount, then the concentration have to uh, increase, and that is really what's happening. So this is the time series of CO2. In this case, CO2 emissions. You see that in 2017, what is still growing in terms of CO2 emission by 2%. So basically, uh, besides all the reports from IPCC over the last 15 years, we are still growing in terms of emissions. And in terms of concentrations, concentrations of carbon dioxide, that's the main greenhouse gases, it was 280 parts per million in, before the Industrial Revolution. So now we are about uh, 404 parts per million in 2019. So what happens? What happened with this? Basically, uh, our species is changing the atmospheric composition. That is the important point behind the global climate change. And this uh, happens not just for CO2, but also for methane and several other trace gases. So what are the consequences of this change of this property that one single species in the planet got uh, to do? Changing the atmospheric composition. So Arrhenius, in 1896, already published a paper uh, showing that if you double CO2 concentration, uh, the increase in temperature would be about 5 degrees centigrade. So basically, look, uh, more than 100 years ago, doing, before quantum mechanics was established, before you have any computer to do this calculation, uh, Arrhenius shows that, okay, this is not new science, uh, if you double the CO2 concentration, temperature increases by five degrees. And he have done just in a uh, ruler, you know, the, all the calculations. So it's really impressive what these guys have done at that time, including Humboldt, uh, Arrhenius, and, and other ones. And this is also, this new, also was not just uh, limited in the scientific community. This is a newspaper report showing that he, uh, we are adding, at that time, 7 billion tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and this tended to make the air a more effective blanket to our planet, and we will heat up the planet. So, scientifically, and also for the general public, we know this for more than 100 years. So, what we are really changing, what is really the important change, is not the CO2 concentration. But it's important to understand that the most important change we are doing for our planet is change what we call the radiative balance of the planet. So basically, uh, we depend 100% of the sunlight that illuminates our planet. We receive 340.2 watts per square meter every single day. Part of this is reflected by clouds. Part is reflected by the atmosphere. And part is absorbed by the biosphere. We use that energy and send back to the space 
a degraded form, form of energy, that is heat, that is trapped by clouds, by aerosols, and by greenhouse gases. So basically what you are doing is increasing these feedback loops with a lot of different consequences for our planet that you're going to see in a few minutes. So uh, right now, in terms of sources and sinks of CO2 into the atmosphere, 91% of the CO2 is being emitted to the burning of fossil fuel. 90% in terms of, uh, is emitted in terms of tropical deforestation. This number was 18% seven, eight years ago. So we were able to reduce this the tropical deforestation from 18% to 9%. It's possible to decrease it even more. We will discuss that later. From all this CO2 injected in the atmosphere, basically 25% is absorbed by the oceans. 31% is absorbed by our forest, and 44% remains into the atmosphere. So you see that one third of all emitted CO2 is being absorbed by forests. And forests are one of the critical elements in our climate system. If you look, to this uh, movie, you see that, for instance, this is how forest absorbs or emits carbon into the atmosphere. So we live in a live planet, so dominated by the biosphere. So basically, you see that in the boreal forest, spring, summer, winter, as you go on, you see that the amount of carbon is stored in the ecosystem. But look what happens with Amazonia. And parts of Africa is the only place where we have this carbon stored permanently. Summer, winter, spring, and so on. So this shows that, oh, oh this is a critically important part of the carbon balance in our world. If you look now to the global distribution of CO2, these movies shows uh, with the higher concentrations more to the red or to the strong yellow, you see that most of the emissions are in the northern hemisphere, where most of the people in our planet lives. So you see much lower concentration in the, um, in the southern hemisphere. And you also see emissions from biomass burning uh, from uh, South America, from Africa, and also from Indonesia. And you see that the atmosphere is shared by everybody. Every molecule of air that you is breathing right now was already breathed in Greenland, in Brazil, in Asia, in Japan, or whatever, uh, thousands of times. So it's a very precious natural resource that we should not waste. So if you look now in terms of energy, this is energy in our planet. So basically, day and night, day and night, as the planet rotates around the sun. So basically, what you can learn here is that tropical regions are critical for the energy balance in the planet. So they receive about 70 to 8% of the energy that is redistributed to temperate regions all over the world. So any change in tropical regions are critically important for the global energy balance. Another important point is uh, water vapor, because water vapor has two important uh, 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 roles in the climate system. First is the most important uh, greenhouse gas. 70% of the energy in the atmosphere is retained by uh, water vapor molecules, a very efficient greenhouse gas, and is also uh, important because it drives the uh, hydrological cycle. So, and you see, for instance, that if you have here, you see uh, water vapor coming from the tropical Atlantic, being processed in Amazonia and redistributed to the temperate regions. Again, the tropics are critical for the water uh, balance point of view. So, if uh, Arrhenius is correct and if the CO2 concentration is increasing, the temperature must be, if the physics works, temperature must be increasing. And actually, if you plot the average global temperature from <coughs> the beginning, uh, the end of the Industrial Revolution uh, to 2016, 
basically our planet have heating up by 1.1 to 1.2 degrees. So that could look a small amount, but actually you see that this has huge impacts in the, in the functioning of the planet. Another important point, this average 1.1 or 1.2 degrees is very inhomogeneous in the planet. So if you look, this is from the IPCC latest report that shows that uh, continental areas heats up much more than oceanic areas. Why? Because water has a huge heat capacity, much larger than the terrestrial ecosystem, and of course it's much more difficult to heat up one liter of water than the same volume in the terrestrial ecosystems. So you see that parts of the Brazilian Northeast already heated up by 2.2 to 2.5 degrees. So now you see that this is already some significant heating. And you see that in the Arctic, parts of the Arctic already observed heating more than three degrees. So when you see the IPCC talking about 1.5 degrees in average, this means two to 2.5 degrees in uh, continental areas. And of course, there, there is a lot of differences in terms of seasonality, summer or winter. So basically, the main message here is that the temperature increase is much higher over land that already is at 1.5 degrees than over the ocean. And that is where we live. But the ocean is extremely important in terms of heat balance in the, in the planet. And if the atmosphere is heating up and the ocean is in co contact with, with the, the atmosphere, the ocean also has to be warmed up. And this is observed. This is trends in ocean temperature. In this case, from the 6th to 2008, you see that several areas of the ocean already heated up by 1.5 to 2 degrees. And this has a huge impact in the marine uh, life because it means less oxygen in the, in the water and that also means more acidity in the ocean water. And also it means increasing sea level. And if you look here, for instance, uh, this is sea level rise from beginning of the Industrial Revolution again to 2010 in average, of course, you need to be careful with this average over the whole planet, ocean already increased by 23 centimeters. And the, the forecast for future, uh, uh, how much will, will increase the ocean sea level, basically, uh, you can see this. This is a National Geographic simulation based on the United States Geological Survey uh, topography. You see that in the future, it's possible that Manaus could be underwater. Asunção can be, uh, have a beach, you know, uh, instead of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Of course, Rio de Janeiro, Porto Alegre, just talking on Latin America. But of course, if you look, to Europe, you know, Belgium, Netherlands, and Northern Germany, you know, could actually be underwater. This will not happen in 10, 20, or 30 years, but as soon as the process starts, it will be extremely hard to stop the, the whole process. So basically, our species got a characteristic of changing the atmospheric composition, change the radiation balance, and the third possible change, changing the geography of our planet. So this happens in Europe, in the United States, in Africa, and in Southeast Asia. And part of this is already happening, of course. Uh, climate change is not in the future, it's actually in the present. And this can be documented by many, many different ways. These are measurements from the GRACE satellite that measure the amount of water in the continents, so basically, you see this trend in amount of water in centimeters per year increasing or decreasing. You see in Brazil, the whole San Francisco Basin has uh, almost uh, is completely dry right now. And we are observing an increase 
in, in precipitation over the La Plata Basin. And you see a decreasing water availability over the Eastern Mediterranean area that is being very strong and very well documented. Part of these changes are natural cycles, and part of these changes caused by climate change. The attribution is very difficult to do. So we we'll have to, to do a lot of science in the next few decades, actually, to do a mechanism of attribution much more accurate than we can do right now. But anyway, this is already happening uh, in our planet, but we don't know exactly where and how much. So this is not a process for the future, but also actually is happening now. So IPCC have done uh, calculations on the radiative forcing. So all these changes that we are observing and increasing 1.1 degrees is just driven by 1.68 watts per square meter for CO2, and the total anthropogenic forcing is 2.29 watts per square meter. Look how sensitive the climate system is to changes in the radiation balance. Only two watts per square meter in 322, if you remember the total number there. So it's very, very sensitive to changes in the radiation balance. And the question is, how will be the future climate? That's a much more difficult question to answer, as you can imagine. But the IPCC have tried to do that making an ensemble of many models, including Max Planck Institute model, Potsdam global model, and, and so on, basically depend on the emission scenarios. But uh, we could have, uh, in the last decade of this century, a heating of about 7 to 7.5 degrees in the northern latitudes. We could have an increase in temperature in Brazil around five degrees. That's a very significant change that will make a huge change in agricultural production and on lifestyle of many of us who live there. So basically, you see that the changes we are talking about are not just changes in, small changes in the style. It's actually something that we really have to take care about. So IPCC a few months ago released uh, uh, the, the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees, and the, trying to answer the UNFCC question. What should we do to limit the increase in temperature to 1.5 or 2 degrees? OK, you know what you have to do? So this is the global net CO2 emissions you have to follow to limit the heating for 1.5 degrees. So basically, in 2020, we have to decrease CO2 emissions by 5% a year. We have to zero emissions in 2040, and it started to have negative emissions after that. So that's a huge task for our society. Um, basically, remember that you are still, from last year to 2018, we have increased the emission by 2.3%. So have to change this to minus 5% per year. So it's a huge change in the energy and in the society as a whole. And then another question is how to get these negative emissions here? There is only one single process that we know that is efficient in removing CO2 from the atmosphere and it's called the photosynthesis. That's it. It's the only process that we know that could work on this large scale. We'll get you to this, this point later. And the IPCC put several possible scenarios for how to get it to 1.5 degrees. Without going too much detail, you see that it, it, it trusts on agricultural, forestry, and other land use, carbon dioxide removal using some kind of geoengineering technique that do not exist yet, and then bioenergy with the carbon capture and storage. So basically, 
we will have to remove CO2 uh, from the atmosphere at a gigantic scale with uh, lots of um, science it still have to be developed on how we're going to do this at the scale that's necessary uh, at a planetary scale. So and then came Amazonia. So Amazonia can be part of the solution for this issue we are discussing. It's a very unique region with global impacts on the carbon balance. We will see that. And also on the hydrological cycle. So basically, it's important to get the message that Amazonia is a key component of the Earth's system, but also is suffering a lot of different changes that we're going to discuss here. And one of the points is that uh, recently, uh, Carlos Nobre and Thomas Lovejoy published a paper in Science showing that uh, if you get 40% uh, deforestation in Amazonia and 30% less precipitation, we cannot ecologically sustain a tropical forest. So all the forest will be gone because it will not have ecological conditions to sustain this type of uh, carbon in the ecosystem. And this is critically important. So if you look at Amazonia, Amazonia is not just important in terms of uh, carbon. Basically, 15% of the global net primary productivity, that's the amount of carbon fixed in the ecosystem, happens, happens in Amazonia, and it has 120 billion tons of carbon. So it's a small fraction of this carbon goes to the atmosphere, bye-bye to us, because then the increase in temperature will be very, very fast, much faster than if the carbon is stored on the ecosystem. On the other side, if you can enhance the fixation of carbon in this ecosystem, eventually this can, uh, we, we can have some more time in terms of uh, the effects in terms of climate change. But also, Amazonia uh, is, is the most powerful hydrological basin in the world. So basically, 18% of fresh water in the global oceans came from the Amazon River alone. And the Amazon River discharge is extremely hard, uh, high. So basically, the hydrology of Amazonia is extremely important globally. In terms of biodiversity, we have about 10% of all the biodiversity species in our world. In terms of climate stabilization, is a very important heat source for the atmosphere with 2.4 meters average rain in Amazonia. Some of parts of Amazonia, we can have 3.2, 3.4 meters of water uh, every year. And also, also cultural, culturally and ethnic is a very, very diverse uh, region. And if you look here, in terms of global net primary productivity in this map, you see that Amazonia is absolutely critical in terms of carbon balance in the world. So if you're going to uh, plant trees to sequester CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, where are you going to plant these trees? in tropical areas. That's the only way that it can work on this kind of scales that you want. But Amazon is also with the problems. The first one is deforestation. So this shows uh, deforestation from the 70s until last year. And you see that Brazil was extremely successful in reducing deforestation from 27,000 square kilometers deforested every year to about 4,500 square kilometer per year, 1,000 square kilometer per year. But look what is happening over the last four years. It starts to go up again. So basically, uh, what should be going down here until we reach zero, actually right now we are deforesting about 8,000 square kilometer per year in 2018, and probably in 2019, this number could be higher. Another way of looking to deforestation is looking to the fiery spots in Amazonia. So basically, we see a very important drop in fiery in fire spots until 2012. But again, you see an increase 
in the number of fired spots. So you see an increase in terms of biomass burning smoke in Amazonia. And this smoke is of continental scale. This is a MODIS image, a remote sensing image, where you see the fire spots in red and the gigantic cloud of smoke that covers South America in a continental scale. Of course, this has profound influences into the ecosystem. And if you look into the tropical tree cover loss from, from the last 20 years, you see that's going up uh, worldwide. It is still increasing. And who are <coughs> the tropical forests in terms of countries? Uh, Brazil, because it has the largest 5.5 million square kilometer of forest, but also in Africa and Indonesia, you see that is not just for Brazil or uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's a worldwide issue that we have to establish policies to reduce deforestation. And Amazonia is also critical for the uh, water vapor transport to places in Brazil and Argentina where agricultural fields are located. So basically, this water vapor is produced in the tropical Atlantic, is processed in the trees in Amazonia, and get to feed the, the soybean and also cotton and many different cultures here in the southern part of, um, of South America. And Amazonia is also changing a lot. So one of the things we are observing is that it's changing in the river discharge in the mouth of the Amazon River is increasing by 30% over the last 20 years for both the wet season and also for the dry season. So actually, what is driven this intensification of the hydrological cycle in Amazonia, possibly the increasing sea surface temperature in the tropical Atlantic. So you see that Amazonia is not an isolated region in the world, but of course it has external forces that can change dramatically the inner work of the ecosystem per se. Another important change we are observing is the increase in the extremes. So basically this is from the beginning of, of, of last century up to the 2015, you see the increase in the, the maximum level of, of water level in Manaus and also a decrease in the minimum level. So actually, we are increasing the extremes in terms of climate for Amazonia. And of course, the ecosystem is not adapted to deal with these increasing uh, fluctuations in terms of precipitation, river level, and so on. Another important point is that the dry season length in Amazonia is increasing. So if you look, into the 80s until the very last day. So the rain starts to come late and late, actually by three weeks over the last 20 years. That's a huge uh, change. And what, what is the consequence of that? Is that if you have a longer dry season, you have more burning, you have more biomass burning. So this is a negative feedback for the ecosystem. So this worries us a lot. But Amazonia is critically important for the carbon cycle. So basically, if you look at the, the, the uh, amount of carbon uh, stored in the tropical intact forest, it's a huge amount that is similar to the amount of carbon uh, emitted to the atmosphere by uh, burning of fossil fuel. But this carbon is having also the carbon allocation is changing in Amazonia. So this is a, a paper published in 2015 that shows the net flux of carbon for the overall Amazonia. This is the productivity photosynthesis from Amazonia, and this is tree mortality. So what we're going to see is that Amazonia, 10 years ago, was absorbing about 0.5 tons of carbon per hectare of forest. So the forest was absorbing the excess CO2 from the atmosphere. But starting three to five years ago, 
the net carbon flux now becomes zero. Why? Mostly because the tree mortality have a significant increase. Why that? Because of the droughts in 2005 and 2010. So the droughts are changing the ecosystem that is very sensitive to the length of the uh, dry and wet season. To monitor this uh, process, you know, we have some very nice German-Brazilian collaborations. Uh, one of them is the Atto Tower that I think your uh, federal president visited last year, right? So basically, it's uh, 325 meters that you built with the Max Planck Institute in the middle of the forest just to monitor the total amount of carbon uh, in the ecosystem. Also, trying to understand the radiation balance, ozone impact on the forest, and so on. Another important collaboration that we're having to monitor the Amazonian ecosystem is uh, the experiment that we're calling Café Brasil, that's chemistry of the atmosphere field experiment in Brazil, where we will bring the G5 from DLR to Brazil to really fly up to 15 kilometers high how the carbon balance is changing, how the atmospheric chemistry is changing, how does this affect the radiation balance. So this is a critically important collaboration for us to understand the science behind the behavior of the Amazonian ecosystem. So and one of the questions that we want to answer is this. So right now, uh, basically, we have the forest in equilibrium. Uh, in a stable, relatively stable equilibrium. So basically, if we deforested uh, and transform it to savanna in the east, southeast, we can change that equilibrium to a different one and reach a very unstable situation like this. So basically, what governs the transition from this to this is uh, to have 40% of total deforested area right now is about 18%. And if you have a, a heating of about 4 degrees, right now the change in temperature is between 1 to 1.5 degrees. So basically, we are not far away from a tipping point where we could destabilize the tropical forest and transform it to a savanna, releasing 120 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere. That will really get the greenhouse effect more uh, important. Talking on this um, tipping points, as we we'll call, the Amazonia is one tipping point, one critical issue in terms of global climate change, is how close you are from a tipping point in the climate system. So which are these, what we we'll call tipping points? So basically, uh, there are several of them. For instance, West Antarctic ice sheet, if it gets destabilized, we can have a huge increase in sea level. Uh, the Amazon rainforest, if you get the Amazon rainforest not uh, sustainable in terms of climate, lots of carbon will be emitted to the, to the atmosphere, changes in the thermal linear circulation, and so on. So there are several feedbacks that could be negative feedbacks to the climate system that could get the, the changes in the climate system much worse than the normal model that works linearly uh, could indicate. And of course, one of them is the Arctic permafrost with the leakage of methane that is stored for thousands of years in the, in the permafrost into the atmosphere. That could be a huge a positive feedback into the climate system that can bring a lot of different uh, um, effects. Another important point that you associate with climate change is the increase in the intensity and frequency of climate extremes. The latest GL6 uh, UNEP report have a chapter on that that shows very clear that we get almost three times more uh, climate extremes than we had just 30, 40 years ago. Mozambique 
a few weeks ago is one example. The, the large increase in the intensity and frequency of hurricanes in the tropical Atlantic is other, typhoons in, in, in the Pacific and so on. Why this is happening? If the ocean gets warm, you have more energy, you intensify this strong uh, climate extremes. Another very important point associated with climate change is how will be our ability to feed 10 billion people in 2050. So uh, FAO and the World Economic Forum are always uh, touch on this issue. And this is the potential impact on food production in a three degrees hotter world. So you see that, for instance, in terms of Brazil and in terms of uh, lots of different areas in Africa, we could have yields in between 10 to 30% less than we have today. And we are 7.6 billion people now. We will be 10 billion very soon. So we have to feed these 10 billion people. How are we going to do this with the, this kind of climate change? That's absolutely unanswered uh, question yet. Another important point is the risk to of biological species. So basically, South America are the highest risk in terms of lost of uh, biodiversity, but of course this could be important for Australia, New Zealand, whose climate is also changing very fast, especially precipitation. So basically this will have impact, global impact, that uh, could feedback on our species very, very strongly. So uh, just to finish, then we have to start a discussion, what future do we want? So basically, in these scenarios, what do we want in terms of future for our so socioeconomic society? So basically, this is a very complex question, as you can imagine. That will depend on a lot of different societal trends, that will depend on our culture, that will depend on our socioeconomic systems, and so on. And then what we want to decide is, do you want a, a, a world where you can limit the temperature to 1, 1.5 degrees, or let continue with business as usual and have a world with 4 to 5 degrees increase in temperature? So that's a political decision that you have to do right now. And science has to say which uh, are the ways we have to go there. So basically, there are solutions for this uh, issue. So what we have to do, it's actually quite simple, scientifically, but not politically, of course. Basically, to do more efficient use of energy, increase the use of low carbon technology, improve carbon sinks, including tropical forest, and of course, the most difficult thing is to have a profound lifestyle and behavior changes. Especially if you remember that 600 million of uh, Indians do not have access to electricity. We have about 1 billion people in Africa that uh, do not have the very minimum level of consumption. And they will have that in the next 20 or 30 years. So what are we going to do with this issue? So it's not an easy question. And the World Economic Forum have tried to answer this question. So every year, they release the Global Risk Report. This is the Global Risk Report released recently by the Glo by World uh, Economic Forum. Look at that in terms of probability, the top five global risk, three of them are related to climate change. Two of them are related to internet and, cy uh, and cyber attacks. So basically, extreme weather events, failure to climate change mitigation and adaptation, natural disaster, are the three main points that the World Economic Forum uh, puts over the table. And this is not the issue raised by scientists or non-governmental, it's not Greenpeace, it's not uh, NGO, it's actually by economists. And in terms of impacts, of course, from the five major impacts, three of them is also associated with the climate change. 
So actually this is recognized by science, but also by the socioeconomic system we have. The United Nations, to deal with this issue, have established the 17 sustainable development goals that every country, Brazil, Germany, and so on, uh, have agreed to transform our world. But the latest IPCC report have done a very interesting analysis that is here on this plot, which are the mitigation options and relationship with the sustainable development goals. So some of them has positive synergies, but also there are neg trade-offs, negative synergies. For instance, if you wanted to provide water for, the, for the, uh, all the population in the world, you have to spend a lot of energy to do that. You have to spend natural resources. So this is a trade-off to the mitigation effects that you have to do. So basically, you see that you, the issue is starting to get more complex and more complicated. And we need very good uh, policy uh, to deal with this particular thing. But science and policy are not the only thing that drives our world. Actually, the ethical issues also are important. And the very best issue on ethical issues is this encyclical Laudato Si from Pope Francis that uh, two years ago mentioned very clear that I urgently appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation which includes everyone since the environmental changes we are undergoing and its human root, roots concern and affect us all. This is not a scientific statement. It's not a, a political statement. It's a moral and ethical statement. And that brings the thing to a much even more complex uh, table that we have to deal with. Science basically have done his job. So here is the cover of only a few of the reports that scientific agency like uh, JL6, IP, the Biodiversity Report, the IGAC and SPARC, uh, the Global Warming of 1.5, uh, um, the American Meteorological Society. So basically, science has done its job. So now is the time to go to the public policies. And the only public policy that is uh, in force right now is the Paris Agreement. But the, the problem is that if you all INDC are fulfilled by all countries, we still will have a warming of about 2.7 to 3 degrees in 2050. So that's a very important point. So the only public policy in force right now is insufficient to deal with the needs of the science and the needs of the population. And we know the difficulties to fulfill this INDC. I will get the example of Brazil. So basically, Brazil has a very strong commitment of reducing by 37% his emission in 2025. It's only six years from now. And 43% by 2030. How, is, how Brazil is proposing to do that? It's a very long document, but basically, uh, zero illegal deforestation at 2030 and compensation of emissions from legal deforestation after that. So, and you saw the history of deforestation. Are Brazil going to fulfill his obligation under the Paris Agreement? It needed to do a lot of effort to do that. Uh, also, Brazil is uh, compromised to restore 12 million hectares of forest until 2030. It's only 18 years from now. That's a huge area. So you need science, you need people, you need money to do that. That's not come up free. So it's not very easy to do. Also, restore, we have a lot of degraded pastures area. So restore 15 million of hectares and have a participation of 45% renewable energy 
uh, at 2030. This part we will get it, but the other three ones will require a lot of different e efforts. So basically, uh, what I want to call the attention is that governance of the climate change issue is a major issue. So basically, as you all know, the United Nations was not, let's say, designed to do this huge task that humanity has right now. So basically, uh, governance is really important. So basically, how the necessary measurements uh, will be implemented and who will drive and control the implementation of these measures by all individual UN countries. So this is a huge task and we do not have in place a proper governance system to do that. Uh, last but not least, there is another important point that has implication for the Paris Agreement, the implication for how we're going to implement these measures, is that the, the country who contributed to the least greenhouse gases will be the most impacted by climate change. So we have a really serious issue of inequality here. So how are we going to deal with this important issue? So basically, Madagascar, you saw, was completely devastated but, uh, recently by the typhoon. His emission is almost negligible. And, this, uh, and the country who have to spend billions and billions of dollars to restore the damage for the uh, typhoon that reached the country. And the same for uh, many, many other countries. And now, if you look to how much in average uh, a family in Germany uh, uh, consumption in one week. Compare that with an Italian family, with an Ecuador family, and with a Chad family. So, if you don't change that, it will be very hard to find a solution that will be acceptable by everybody. So that's a critically important issue that is, is still not over the table, at least clearly. And the role of science. This is science here. This is the economy. This is the society. This is governance. And this is mitigation and adaptation. For us to build this whole building, science is the basis, of course. Without science, without the work of IPCC and thousands of scientists over the last third year, we will not be uh, speaking here. But science is not enough. Of course, we have economic issues, societal issues that we have to build up for this house of climate change. And more than that, if you look here, how we're going to work in science, in public policies, and so on, to build, this is the basic needs for the society, water, food, education, resilience, uh, jobs, and so on. And these are the limits for our planet boundaries. How are you going to build in the, a safe and just system from the universe, from, for, for the humanity from linking the basic needs to the limits of our planet? So this is a task that the scientific, um, that you have to deal with, that with, the, with the, as much as possible, and how uh, and that we need very solid, solid science and public policy to build this space that will link the basic needs of the population with the limitation of our uh, planet. And then uh, climate is just one single issue. Our planet is being transformed much more than just climate. And if we need to analyze the climate issue integrated with all the other things that are already going on, in the, in the planet, like uh, changes in the consumption and production, decarbonization of the energy, how to provide food, biosphere, and water. 80% of the population in 2050 will be living in cities. How to build sustainable cities? That's not a very trivial uh, issue. How we're going to deal with the digital revolution that are uh, going on right now? And most important, how to look at all these issues 
in an integrated way. So this is a, a challenge that the university, that the scientific community, together with the policymakers, have to get. And actually, we cannot fail doing that because 10 billion people will depend from the solution to this particular problem. So basically, uh, if you want to avoid the warming of four to five degrees, uh, the message is very clear that there is no other way than to use our natural resources in our planet more efficiently and more intelligently than we are doing right now. And if Humboldt would be with us here, remember the very first transparency, certainly he would make very similar recommendation. <laughs> so basically you see that 200 years, we did not advance too much in terms of building up sustainability and integrated science to deal with the needs of our planet. So the moment is right now, is not 10, 20 or 30 years from now. It will be too late if it's not too late already. So we have an urgent task to do that now in science, in society and in public policies. So thank you very much for the attention.